Well, hello all. Uh, I've got garlic in my hair, apparently. My daughter's telling me, which is quite normal. Um, well, welcome to um, the Say Cheese uh, Cheese Festival. Literally doing it online for a second time. I can't believe it, fellow shoppers from Koran. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing that we've got this far, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm making something that I make, you know, when you're having friends over uh, or people dropping in for drinks, which is going to happen really soon because we're going to get to that point. Uh, and I think it's pretty exciting. Obviously, beautiful cheese as it is, is fantastic um, on a cheese board. But this just takes it another step up, if you like. Um, using two different, two of my favourite cheeses, obviously a base cheddar, which uh, is just, I always go for something quite bitey. Um, usually something that has a little bit of kick to it um, that melts really well. Uh, and then I'm using a, um, a Comte Gruyere as well, which is just delightfully nutty uh, and quite delicious, especially when cooked or raw. Now, the first thing I'm doing is, because we have to get onto a few things here, <laughs> is I'm actually getting the garlic peeled and into the oil. Um, it could have been on the prep list, but I didn't think about the fact that it might take you guys quite a while to peel the garlic. I'm pretty much done and I'm throwing it into the oil and we're just gonna confit the garlic, which usually takes quite a long time um, if you roast the bulb whole in the oven, which is an option. But for this particular cook-off, I thought we'd do it in some olive oil and then use that oil in the tart. So get on to peeling those cloves of garlic, cut them in half and drop them in to the oil and then set them on low while we're making the pastry. I'm gonna have you all racing. <laughs> I, don't, I have to admit that I haven't done too many cook along demos. Obviously I've done a lot of um, uh, in-person demonstrations, but not actually online. Obviously use cooking to camera, but um, so if there are any questions or if I'm going too fast, please let us know and I'll try and answer them. I do have an assistant here, Stella, my daughter, <laughs> um, who is gonna help me answer some of your questions and slow me down if I'm going too fast. So I'm just gonna pop the garlic on the heat in the extra virgin olive oil, I think it's about 100 mils on low, and we're just gonna let that caramelize and go, you know, deeply golden which will probably take about 10 minutes. I'm gonna need a cloth. Okay. So if you're still doing that, that's fine. Um, the other thing I wanted to say too, the radishes you received, let's, um, while you're doing the garlic, you need to put your radishes into some cold water and just bring them to life, crisp them up. And I actually wanna use some of the greens on the top just for decoration. But if you put them into cold water now, by the time we finish the tart, they'll be amazing. Here are some of mine that I've actually already just thrown in and I've left. But just throw the bunch in at the moment and rinse them off and set them aside in cold water while we get onto the pastry. So hopefully garlic's done. So funny talking to camera and not having a cameraman here. <laughs> so this pastry, uh, it is divine. It's an olive oil pastry. It, um, the trick is to add an, a, um, the warm water to the base. It's pretty simple. It's pretty forgiving. It's very easy to cook. Um, it has a lovely crisp sort of soft finish uh, that is just perfect for a quick tart like this and it doesn't take very long. You could make it by hand if you don't have the food processor, but this does make it very quick for you. Um, you see that there. So we're starting off with our, what is it? 380 grams of flour. Oh, and by the way, this recipe is also easily multiplied if you wanted to make a couple of tarts. Um, but we'll just start with the base one. The 380 of plain flour. And a couple of pinches of salt in there. Now what is it? 180 mils of warm water. So I've got 150 mils of cold and I've just got some boiling water that I have from the kettle 
the tap. I'm just going to top this up. Sorry, just 150. So I'm topping my cold water up with some boiling water or some very hot water to 180 mils. Oh, a bit much. And then the best thing about this recipe is that you're throwing the flour and the salt into the mixer. And you literally have got your 60 mils of olive oil and your water and you turn the mixer on and you pour them in at the same time. And the dough will come together to a soft ball. I really feel I'm going too fast. <laughs> it's really hard for me to tell. Anyway. Just checking my garlic. It's on a medium heat. I'm just wanting it to bubble away and simmer to a, a deep golden. So don't forget to check that while you're making pastry. So the dough is lovely and soft. It hasn't come together in a big ball, but it's in big clumps, which is exactly what you're after. Because I'm going to turn this out onto a lightly floured board or bench, whatever you've got in front of you, preferably a dry one. Bit, bit of flour handy, not too much, just rubbing it in like that. And then tipping the mix out onto the bench. You'll feel it's lovely and silky and soft. So I had the garlic on medium heat, I can hear it just ticking away. I'm going to turn it down to low. Give it a bit of a swirl. and let it keep going. Okay, the dough, just bringing it together on the bench. Now, it doesn't need a knead, need a knead. It doesn't need to be kneaded as such. It's just really bringing it to a smooth ball. You don't want to develop the gluten at all. It's not a bread dough, it's quite a short, crisp dough. A light flour, and then you can wrap it in some baking paper or cling film or a recycled freezer bag, anything just to cover it. and let it rest. Then I'm going to give it a quick rest. Setting that aside. Just clean the bench down. One of the best ways to clean a bench it's not to get your scourer out, but just to scrape your flour and whatever muck you've made, be it butter or water. Because if you add if you add water to this, it turns to glue on the bench. So I always use a scraper quite a bit. You've got some questions there. Are you able to use gluten-free flour? Ah, gluten-free flour. I haven't experimented this particular recipe um, with gluten-free, but there will be a mix out there on the market that will probably work because there's so many different types or blends of gluten-free flour um, that, well, are made up of so many different things. So I'm sure there is one out there that would work. I can't recommend a brand exactly. Um, I have worked at, uh, on a, um, a gluten-free pastry mix 
that um, or pastry that I've put together that will be coming out in my book next year. Um, that would be perfect for this sort of tart. Um, and I can't remember the exact quantities of that off the top of my head at this point. But um, no, it's untested, but I'm sure that there, there would be a brand out there you could use. What was that? Wine. Where's my wine? One of those, but let's give them a few minutes. <laughs> yes. So I suppose if I was serving this later on, I have a cider available. I also would probably go for a, what else? An Albarino would be quite, quite nice. Um, an unwooded Chardonnay would drink quite well, or even just a good old fashioned um, Guinness. Uh, or what else? Probably a really, really cold beer would even do. <laughs> um, you could also serve this chart up with some, um, Anchovies would be quite nice on the side. So then maybe a dry sherry would be applicable. Um, I think also, I have to go and get my glasses on still. Hmm. We can, okay, cool. So let's just check on the garlic. That's coming along nicely. The next step, what I will do is just, because I want to let that pastry rest a little bit. Mum, were you supposed to add salt to the garlic? Uh, not yet, no. Did it say that in my recipe? No. Possibly. No? No, I don't think it did. No. There's going to be enough salt in the cheese, and we added salt to the pastry. Um, I'm just going to pick some of the leaves off the radishes while we're waiting for everyone to catch up. Or maybe we have. And the other step really is to roll the pastry next. So you just need to give it at least five minutes. I'm sure my recipe says give it 20 or half an hour. Let's talk about a couple of different other cheeses we could use in this tart. I was thinking today that it would be quite beautiful with a blue cheese. Um, a blue cheese, maybe some gorgonzola and ricotta in the tart the same way, and then serve that up with some fresh figs or some um, balsamic marinated onions, um, or even a dried fig that's been reconstituted in vincotto or a sherry. Um, a sherry vinegar would be quite nice as well. Now I've got a cheddar here that I haven't grated yet, so I might get on to doing that. You could use any cheddar, as I said before. Um, there's this wax vintage cheddar. I also got a cloth bound cheddar that is something that I tried at the market today because I was shopping. It was a Cabot cloth bound cheddar from Vermont. Sometimes you just stumble across a cheese that is quite delicious. Um, and this one is in particular. I think when it comes to cooking with cheese in a tart like this, you would seek something that you really love off, straight off the cheese board because you're eating it the same sort of way. It, it will gently melt in the tart. The tart is really good at room temperature, but it's also quite delightful hot straight out of the oven, but it's good cold as well. Um, so I might just grate a little bit of that. Now I'm hoping you've all got your ovens on preheated. Um, and you'll also need a baking tray that's been lined Choose a, tr a, a tray that's some like, a, I suppose like a large flat tray, the heavier the better because the residual heat will help cook the tart. Um, or even like a, a, a biscuit sheet is what they call it sometimes. So a tray without edges would be best. Okay, I'm gonna check my garlic again. And cooking garlic like this, I can't see. How brown should it be? Yeah, I'm trying to show you that right now. <laughs> Mine's just starting to go golden now, but you really want it to be quite soft because it's going into the tart. So this needs another couple of minutes so that when you bite into the tart, you're not biting into a big clove of garlic. And we're also making some garlic oil at the same time. 
which is going to get brushed on the outside of the tart. Okay. What else are you doing? Has everyone picked their radishes? I'm sure they have. Yep. Because <laughs> this tart, this pastry is so wonderful, it is pretty much ready to go. A little bit of flour on there, I'm going to cut it in half. Mike, can you cook it in a skillet? Skillet. Can you cook it in a skillet? Uh, you could do. Yeah. I don't see why not. I think, um, you mean in the fry pan on the stove on the heat? Or you could put it into a shaped, yeah, or handleless fry pan, if that's what you mean, I'm thinking. Yes. In the oven. This is what my tray looks like. It's a heavy old. Okay. You should see the mess I'm making here. <laughs> and I set up and prepped. So you guys are just doing a fine job there. Now, can you move the comments off my face if possible? <laughs> Cutting your dough in half. Now this is a free from tart. Don't stress about pastry, okay? This is ultimately the most forgiving pastry you're gonna handle. Um, the shape of your tart really doesn't matter as long as you get your cheese in there and get it sealed. We're gonna start with one half. And a little bit of flour on the bench. Uh, Stella, can you read, what did my instructions say? You know that I rarely follow my own recipes. <laughs> you probably find that quite Rose amusing. Roll to a four millimeter thick yeah, round. I was going to say four or five mil. That would be good. And then transfer to the tray. So, when it comes to handling pastry, I never really heavily flour the bench, but I always tend to flour the rolling pin. And I'm just going to roll this out. Now, you could get a little fancy and make a rectangle tart once you've had a go at this once. But we're gonna do round today, because it's the easiest to handle. Now I say to roll it out to about four mil, or just under four thick. Four mil thick, yeah. Yeah, do I give an approximation of how big? No. No, it should be okay. Like 40 centimeters. No approximation. 50 centimeters. So Rain one half is gonna be the base of the tart. And the other half is the top. Okay. You can see that it's stretching back or it's like pulling back a little bit. That's because it could probably do with an extra, you know, five or 10 minutes resting, but we'll get there. Oh, just check in that garlic. Perfect. Let's have a look. It's lovely and golden. Your house should be perfumed with garlic by now. It is. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to reduce the heat right down. I think it's almost, you know, another minute or two and this will be done. I wish you could see that there. Something funny out there, guys, because Stella's here waiting, thinking, what are we having for dinner tonight? And she said to me, so mum, how are you gonna make the um, fish stew at the same time as do the demonstration? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I'm gonna do the cheese pie first and then I'm gonna make the fish stew for dinner. <laughs> but I do have a chicken stock on in the background because I did go to the market, cram market today. And I've also got a fish stock ticking away over there in the other pot. Um, it's gonna be more like a aqua pasta type stew, Stella and everyone else. Um, I'm just going to saute some garlic and tomatoes uh, and then soften them down <clears throat> and then sear the fish a little in the extra virgin olive oil. Uh, maybe add a little bit of chilli, add some white wine, steam open the mussels at the same time as cook the fish. And then we would have it with a fresh salad and possibly some bread, which I didn't get, but I thought we'd be having this cheese pie anyway. What else? We could put some little pastina pasta in or fregola. That's a Sardinian tiny pasta. Okay, back to the pie. I digress. How, how big do you think it is? How's it looking? 
how's it looking? Here we go. We're about that big. So at this point, it's probably about, what is it? 35 centimetres, approaching 40 centimetres wide. I'm popping it onto my tray. What sort of tray am I using for this stuff? Is that a measuring tray? Standard size flat baking tray. Anyway, so here, this is a rough freeform pie. I've just thrown it on. We're all up to that stage. First thing that's going to go down is the um, gruyere. The Comte. So we've got how many grams of that? 150 grams of the Comte. Now I'm just dropping that onto the pastry. And that's in little cubes or rectangles, if you like. But when you drop it on the pastry, leave a bit of an edge around the outside because this is where we're going to seal the top of the pie, or the lid on top. That makes sense. I'm not sure what the recipe says, but next in I'm going to put the confit garlic and then I'm going to top it with the grated cheddar. No, so yeah, you do the gruyere, then the grated cheese, and then the garlic. Oh, okay, I'll follow the recipe. <laughs> Everyone will get too confused out there. Okay, gruyere down, and then we'll put the cheddar on top and this is finely grated why have I done two different textures here because I want to control the way they melt so the cheddar is going to ooze and, and sort of be quite delicious around the smaller cubes of the comte so you'll be able to detect the comte when you're eating it and the cheddar will be more melty around it melty is that a word the cheddar will be melted and will be oozy and a bit drippy maybe Maybe not. It's very cheesy. Well, that's what this festival is all about, isn't it? I mean, how much do we love cheese? What are your favourite cheeses, Stella? Um, my favourite cheese is probably goat's cheese yes. and like I a fresh goat's a fresh cheese. Goat's or cheese. Fresh goat's cheese, like or goat's curd. Yes. And then I also love halloumi and saganaki, like fried cheese. Yeah, saganaki is huge in this house. Um, Halloumi is quite I big. love halloumi too. Yeah. And I like strachino as well. Strachino. Yeah. This is, strachino is a cow's milk cheese that melts beautifully. It's great in a um, toasted, cheese. toasted cheese sandwich. Which, by the way, I think that is on tomorrow, the toasted cheese sandwich, judging um, that is the end of the Say Cheese Festival online. So do tune in for that. We've got I think there's three or four entries and we've got some amazing judges too, judging the toasted cheese sandwich situation. Okay, let's do garlic now. Okay, let's have a look at the colour of the garlic. It's deeply golden. Mom, how do you spell the cheese for toasties? Like, how, how do you spell that name? Strachino. Strachino. S-T-R-A-C-C-H-I-N-O, I think. Strachino. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, that's the toasties cheese. Oh, that's just one in yeah. this house. Oh, the other thing I do with strachino too is I've made, um, when truffles were in season, I made wet polenta, popped it into a big dish and poached big chunks of strachino and um, grated reggiano over the top of it and then baked it in the oven for about 15 to 20 minutes and all the cheese melted together and caused this raft on top of the polenta. And then when it came out, I, um, I had some truffles, which we had been sampling, and I grated the truffle over the top and served it with um, some bitter greens like um, chima di rapi, pan fried with some garlic and some broccoli, sprouting broccoli. Um, and that was a delicious meal because everything was just in season on the hand. Okay, I'm spooning the garlic over the top. I digress again. That's what happens when you get me started talking about food. I just get very excited um, and sort of get carried away with the season or whatever's on hand. Um, 
Mm. I don't actually look at things as being vegetarian as such. It's just what's in season and, you know, the best way to actually cook it and prepare it. And, yeah, that was a vegetarian meal, but it was delicious, especially the strachino cheese and the truffle. I'm just drizzling a little bit of the um, warm olive oil, extra virgin olive oil that's flavoured with garlic over the top. But you want to save some of it. I am saving some of it. I will transfer it, do that actually, transfer the olive oil that you put the garlic into another bowl. It's going to be too hot to brush on the pastry. Mum, what can you sub for the Aleppo pepper if you don't have it? Uh, yeah, if you don't have Aleppo pepper, Time. you could use cayenne pepper, yeah. um, really finely ground chilli pepper, um, obviously a smoky, a, a smoky chilli. Um, you could actually put really finely chopped jalapenos over the top, pickled jalapeno if you wanted to, um, and sort of change the flavour profile a little bit. Um, but we'll, you could use black pepper or black and white pepper maybe. The Aleppo pepper is a soft, fruity sort of chilli. It is not over the top hot. It's quite gentle. Um, it plays beautifully with the cheese profile. And you can see, here's my tart now. I'm sure you guys are keeping up and you've got the same tart in front of you. Now, if you like a little bit of heat, put a little bit more Aleppo pepper. If not, just a tiny bit over the top. Okay, so that is the base of the tart done. You've got your Gruyere. Finely grated cheddar over the top, quite generously. I'll put a little bit more, actually. You can never have too much cheese, can you? No. Oh, you can, actually. <laughs> you can? I have eaten too much cheese. I feel this sick. Plus, this is a assay cheese festival, so, so let's get a little carried away. You can get carried away. Yeah. Now, if your cheddar crumbles, don't stress. It can just go in as well. Especially if you're grating it. I've got a microplane here, but you could use any fine grater. Although I do love these things. If you don't have one, you really should get one. Uh, great for chocolate, grating fine nutmeg. chocolate, nutmeg, um, citrus, be it lemon, orange, um, lime, uh, gar grated garlic, Anything you need to grated right. tomatoes. Okay, so pushing my tray aside, let's roll out the other piece of dough. For the lid. Just Slightly in the smaller, five millimetres. Slightly smaller. Well, there you go. Slightly smaller than five millimetres thick. Glad Stella's here. She's keeping me honest. So it needs to be thicker than it was previously. Oh, does it? By one millimetre. Okay. You can judge that. Do I say to wet the edges or do we just leave it as it is? Um, you just leave it as it is. Yeah, that's better. Okay, just reminding everyone, you should have your ovens on fan force if possible on 200 degrees to cook this tart. Hmm. Uh, it is getting a little sticky. It's, good getting it, it's getting a little humid in here. I'm just putting a little bit more flour under my dough and over me. The other great thing about this tart is you could make it up to this point and then that you've sealed it with the cheese inside and then pop it in the fridge and then just before you want to serve it you can bake it off. So it is something you could prepare earlier. I've never held one frozen but I would think it would work as well. There we go, no, any more questions? No more questions for the moment. That's good. I really um, would encourage questions if you have any. I'm not used to doing such a silent feedback. <laughs> oh, there was one question someone oh, asked about who was it that said cheese is milk's leap to mortality? I'm not sure who said that, actually. Someone saying about a quote. Oh, there's a beautiful quote. Yeah, it says cheese 
is milk's leap to immortality. Okay, I'm going to search that up. Okay, okay, I'm having trouble here because I'm concentrating on a few things. This pastry is so forgiving. If it does stretch or break, you can literally just push it back together, which I have done there. And I've also managed to get Aleppo pepper in my pastry. So roughly the same size for the lid, maybe a tad smaller. And now for the finale, I'm actually dropping the lid on top of the pie. If you do roll it too big, don't stress because you can wrinkle it and it can get that beautiful rippled effect on top. Okay, we're up to that. So I usually handle the dough on the back of my hands to try and not put a hole through it. So doing that, or you could actually roll it onto the rolling pin, which is a bit fancy. So I have the pie in front of me, and now I'm going to place the lid over the top just by doing that. And you'll see little dimples in the top of your tart, which is the peaks from the cheese. So if we do want a little bit of decorative, a decorative feature on, on this, you can stretch the pastry a little bit once you've dropped it on top and just ripple it slightly. And then when it bakes, those peaks are going to be quite golden, a little more golden than say the edge. It doesn't say this in the instruction, I'm just being creative. <laughs> Okay, so now with your fingertips, are we all good, everyone? Is everyone up to this stage? Yep, yep. Yep. So I'm just pressing with my fingers the top quite firmly onto the bottom. No, it doesn't say that into the, in the instructions either. And at this point, you could fold and crimp with a fork to shut the pie or you could roll the edge in on itself or you can have a go at what I'm about to do yourself could you just get the camera to come a little further down so this is what I do on the edge of a calzone and it looks like this you get this yeah you get this beautifully roped effect which is really divine and you can see these wrinkles I've done that on purpose because I know that that's going to present beautifully once I've finished but um I'm going to just put one finger here and pull and push the dough over the top of half of my finger and then repeat. And you end up with this roped effect, which looks really good because again, those little edges are going to become quite golden in the oven. We better get this thing in the oven though. Maybe here. I'll go over time, which is quite normal for my cooking you classes. Do you have time? Do I have time? Yeah. Oh, bonus. So, can you see that rope effect? Now, if this isn't working for you at home, don't stress. Get out the fork, push the pastry in on itself, and just press either with your fingers or a fork or a, or a knife, or give this a go. I really want your feedback now. <laughs> People saying cool trick. When I had my pizza restaurant, Mr. Wolf, which I no longer have, um, so we sold it, we sealed all of our calzones, which is a closed pizza pie, the exactly the same way. It looks really nice. It does look nice, doesn't it? And my pie is not perfectly round. It's a little oval, but that's okay. You know what? When it comes to cooking and, I mean, pastry for sure, the quantities need to be right, but the shapes can be a little free form or a little um, wild but composed, if you like, a little like myself. Um, I think that you, that creativity or things not being identical um, present really well because it doesn't look like it's come out of a packet or you know a, a, a factory. You've made it yourself. It's got your own personality in there. And I've got this bit uneven bit here at the end, but I'll just seal that by stretching 
further this way and going over on itself. There. I hope you guys get to upload your um, your finished products because I'd really like to see how you go. <laughs> uh, I can't see everyone. It's hard to get all 20 screens, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so to prick the pie, we will need to put a little hole. Here you go, Mum, you can see everyone now. Oh, wow, I can see everyone. Well oh, done. There's everyone's, there's everyone's touch. I'm impressed, people. Well done. <laughs> okay, uh, a little pair of scissors or a knife would nick the pie beautifully. Did some of you do the ripple as well? In the top, yep, all good. Oh, that's good, I like seeing. I'll keep, I'll keep it there. Sorry, I, I was just looking at myself the whole time. Do you know how terrible that is? Much better seeing all your faces. Jeepers, creepers. Tell you what, COVID's done not a lot of good for, yeah, everyone doing Zoom all the time and you're having a big picture of yourself in front of you. It's really confronting, isn't it? <laughs> Um, okay, so I've got some scissors here. You could use a knife. I'll probably suggest a knife in there, but I'm going to... You, you say to uh, brush it first. I'll brush it first. Thanks, Stel. Yeah, before we get the scissors. Okay. Uh, I had a brush here somewhere. It's right there, under the, under the radishes. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay, let's go back to that oil that's cooled down. It's Mine's still lovely and warm. I'm just going to dip my brush in. And then just brush the top very lightly. Don't be too heavy handed. You don't want it to be oily at the end. Just giving a slight glaze or gloss to the top. I'm concentrating on the edge of the pie first. And then I'm going to hit some of the bits that are sticking up a bit more than others. Wow, it's looking good, smelling good. Now this oil you could use for other things. What would I do? Because it's only, it's extra virgin olive oil, scented with garlic. Um, I'll talk about that once we get the pie in the oven actually. Okay, I'm just gonna put three little nicks in, or well, five maybe, let's do five. Just like that just to allow the steam from the cheese melting to escape. And because I can't help myself, a little sprinkling of salt over the top of the pie and then into the oven mid to upper shelf for 15 to 20 minutes. I'll put mine right at the top because I want it to cook in time. 15 minutes? Yeah. How are we going for time? It's 6.38. So Whoa. Doing good, cutting it. Okay, fine. It's okay. Um, someone's asked. I'm putting my oven on 210. Hopefully I get a result. You guys cook yours a little slower if you like. But I really want to show you the finished product. Someone has asked. Um, how long will the oil last? Like oh. uh, I keep it for a week or two. Um, probably I'd keep it near my stove where I'm cooking all the time. I might add a little splash to a cluster. I might add some dukkah to the oil and serve it with some bread. Um, I might braise onions in it. Um, you could stir fry in it. Sometimes I use extra virgin olive oil for stir frying. Um, what else could you do with it? Just thinking. Probably wouldn't make a vinaigrette or anything out of it because it's been, it is heavily scented with with the garlic, uh, but I would make a dumpling dipping sauce. There you go, there's an idea. Um, yeah, out of that garlic oil. So back to the radishes, just picking them out of the water, that ice water now, because I still had a few more. So there's a big one, but I took all the big leaves off. Sometimes I like leaving the other little leaves on. If you get I'm tending to go for bunches that have a few small ones in there. I find they're a little pep more peppery um, and not, some of the radishes are getting a little woody inside these days, but we go through a lot of radishes in our house, don't we? 
Pretty the much throwing them into all sorts of salads, from everything from a Niswa style salad to just a snack on the side with cheese, um, with gravlax especially. So we do a bit of a clean up, which I'm sure you all are doing as well. The other thing I've got on hand and you would have got delivered was some caper berries and some of those, um, the pickled cocktail onions, which I'm obsessed with at the moment. These ones have been cooked in balsamic and are pickled, I think, or been caramelized, I think, and then dropped into vinegar. Um, I've been putting them into all sorts of things. Uh, everything from making a tartare sauce at home, just chopping them up and stirring them through with gherkins and capers and parsley and tarragon or um, whatever the herbs you're adding chives. Uh, I have been slicing them up and adding them to a lemon vinaigrette. So lemon juice, extra virgin olive oil, these little onions chopped finely with a whole handful of tarragon and some beans, for instance, makes a great salad. Um, I think they've even made their way into the odd martini as well <laughs> at home. I suppose now I've got a bit of time to answer the odd question here and there. Cooking questions I'm taking. Do you need to do anything special to the radishes? Not really. Um, if you want to do something really nice to them to make, to present beautifully is you could just coat them in a little bit of extra virgin olive oil before you serve them and they'll be glossy. They'll be very glossy. You could dip them into that garlic oil if you like. You can see how shiny that is. I'm just getting my board ready to present the pie on. Round, rectangle, wooden board, marble board, whatever you've got, glass, whatever takes your fancy. This cheese that's left over, any bit, I will always put into a container. It will probably end up in one of my favourite things at the moment is just to have a simple cheese omelette with a few spears of asparagus. Um, for breakfast because we have time these days <laughs> instead of brushing out the door but not for long hey i must tell you i'm really looking forward to going to go myself going to a restaurant obviously i'm reopening hero at fed square uh we're taking bookings now on the 5th of um november i think we're about almost half full, which is really great. But personally, I'm really looking forward to going to a restaurant, having someone bring me a plate of food and a few drinks and whatever I feel like, and then take it away so I don't have to do the dishes anymore. There's been so much food. Although I must say my girls, Stella and Amber, are really good at clearing the table now and loading the dishwasher. So thank you, Stella. <laughs> um, but when you cook so many meals at home, which you've probably all been doing, how much mess does it make? I mean, cheapest creepers. Dish pan hands. I need that manicure. <laughs> okay, so presentation is everything. Well, not everything. Flavour is everything. When it comes to cooking and plating up, for me, most of the well, almost all the time, I'm chasing flavour over presentation. Things are never garnished or on my dishes or in my cookbooks or on top of something if it's not there for a reason and it's usually flavour based. You will never see a dish of mine with a sprinkling of diced red capsicum for colour. I don't do things for colour, I do things for flavour. Um, and I think that if you're learning to cook and you're experimenting with things, think about what goes with what first rather than it looking good at the last minute. Um, it's the biggest tip I think that I can give to those learning to experiment with new things or new ingredients. Just have a taste, think about what goes with what and then use it rather than grabbing something just because you think it, you know, it needs a bit of colour. Anyway, I've had a lot of arguments with chefs over the years from that. But um, all the food you see in all of my cookbooks and on TV and, um, and in the column, I accept the column actually in Fairfax. Um, I have the Meppins now who are plating my food up, but I give instruction on how things are garnished. Uh, so everything's relevant. I think that's what it comes down to. A 
curators. I love those bowls. I am really missing thrift shopping these days because little glass bowls like this show up in thrift shops all over Melbourne and I've been collecting crystal because I think you can really get um, a great contemporary look but using something classic from the past like this. I know it's got legs and all the rest of it, but it actually quite works, um, Mom, especially for radishes. Is there an alternative to garlic in this recipe? I can um, you could use a celery heart. Um, so that's the inner leaves of the celery. There's a fine yellow centre, sliced and caramelised the same way in the oil. Um, so slice it finely. And I would probably add some fennel seeds at the same time and caramelise it for approximately 10 minutes as well and it will soften but still have a little bit of bite to it. That would be quite divine with the cheese. Actually, celery and celery seed go really well with cheeses like this. I'm hoping you've all got your pies in the oven by now. Yes, we're good. <laughs> Mostly so. I've also got another little glass bowl here with the caper berries. Um, Another green leaf that would go really well with this pie if you wanted to make larger ones or longer ones and cut sections and actually serve it up as an entree starter uh, would be some rocket leaves or even that backyard rocket, you know, that larger rocket that you used to be able to get where you can grow quite easily. Picking those leaves, they're really peppery. Um, again, working back with the richness of the cheese in the tart would be quite good. Uh, watercress, another garnish. Watercress, yeah. You have watercress. We do have watercress. I also have, um, there's some fenugreek I found at the brand market over the last couple of weeks. Um, some of the green grocers are selling it. It's like a, actually I've got some here. It's a really interesting. Um, if someone's asked if their radish is too big, do they need to cut it? Oh yeah, cut them in half or quarters. You can cut them in half or quarters if they're too big. Half or quarters. Um, this is the, sorry, this is, I'm going to have to put that into some ice water, but you can see it's almost like a clover. Um, this is fresh fenugreek, which is great in salads. Um, it's used a lot in Lebanese and Middle Eastern cookery in salads, not necessarily stir fried and eaten soft, but fresh like this, picked. Uh, it has a mild sort of greeny, mm, similar to watercress in a way. Slightly peppery, but a little sweeter. Um, usually comes with roots on the end. As I said, this has been in the bottom of the crisper with another bunch of celery. But that would be quite good on this as well. Uh, did you set a timer still? Yes, yes I do. we have five, five minutes left on our Really? Time. Yeah. Five minutes and 20 seconds. Five minutes. You know what? It's nowhere near cooked. <laughs> so you might need more. So you might 20 need minutes. More time. I said one to 15 minutes. No, I that's said okay. One. I don't know how your ovens are going. Um, are there more alternatives to celery? Oh, you've already done that. Oh, it's on that one. Okay, I'm asking any random cooking questions now. You've got me. I think. Anything you need. Did you hear they're relaunching My Kitchen Rules apparently next year? Yeah, <laughs> there's some people there. Very, oh, you are carrying my kitchen rules. Got it. Oh my gosh, look. I can see. What name? Who are you? Um, um, Brett. Brett. Okay. I can't see that name, but yes. Anyway, what all those? What all those cooking? Wow. Someone's How cool. Hi. <laughs> someone's asking if Manu is coming back. Manu. He's just been on SAS. Isn't he just still on SAS? Lost. Oh, that like scared of drowning? No, Sorry, he gave up. He that? gave up. No, he didn't give up. Yes. He just he left. decided that it wasn't quite for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I haven't heard anything other than the fact that yeah, they're casting and looking, but who knows what twenty twenty two holds? I think the best thing about all of those cooking shows, um, and I suppose even a possible silver lining. COVID is like it's got so many people cooking and experimenting and and using um well discovering new flavors and new methods of cooking and uh, and shopping at a fresh food place like any of our markets that we have in Melbourne especially the pram market I think it's really 
a lot of people have stumbled across the market and been quite pleasantly surprised um, in comparison to shopping in a supermarket these days. What else you got there, Stella? It's different pages. I'm just looking. Seven. My tech person shifting me around. There you go. You got back to that. Which is, is interesting because for me, I've always shopped at markets. I, but that is because of my upbringing. I remember my mother um, and my grandmother taking me to the Preston market which is one of my earliest memories and being wheeled around in a pram, nursing a watermelon, because <laughs> they were buying the whole watermelon, uh, and being up against the glass and looking at the fish with their googly eyes through the glass, which you would think that would terrify um, a young girl, but I was actually obsessed with the whole fish. And back then my parents would only buy um, mullet, no, sand mullet, sand mullet, sand mullet whole. Um, for some reason it wasn't gutted. Oh, I know why it wasn't gutted because they were, my father loves the mullet row inside and he used to salt it and leave it in the bay window um, near our kitchen table and dry it out. And then he would um, slice the mullet row finely and have it with um, baguette and butter and lemon juice. Can you, um, um, which, yeah. can you recommend any blue cheese? Blue cheeses, Oof, I love Stilton. I love gorgonzola picante. I love gorgonzola dolces, which is quite a sweeter um, blue cheese that you would use with honey and more in a dessert way, if you like, or one of those mid-course style dishes, maybe with um, some fresh figs. Um, gorgonzola, Stilton, Rockford. Uh, I'm obsessed with Luch at Stilton at the moment, or Rocket with pear and rocket salad. It's a very um, nice. sort of what is it, the late eighties, early nineties sort of salad that was on every menu. But um, I think it's sometimes the simplicity of those flavours, uh, especially blue cheese and pear, or even green apple in a salad. And then grab yourself some walnut oil. That's a revelation. But do buy the smallest container you can possibly get because. Any nut oils do tend to um, go a little rancid at times um, quite quickly. So you need to use them up over a matter of weeks, not months. Anyway, let's have a look at the pie in the oven and see all the cheese tart. I'll see how it's going. Um, and Mum, can you explain to everyone how you dress and present the pie once it's ready? Because it's going to finish soon. Mum? Yeah. It's really funny. It's, you've got like 25 seconds to, you need another five minutes, but how would you dress this? So what do you, just I would what you literally do. slide the hot tart onto this wooden chopping board that I have um, and then cut it into sort of uneven wedges and then um, maybe slice up some of those little pickled onions and drop them on top. That's my timer. I need another five minutes. minutes. I'm not getting the colour that I want on the tart. I'm going to try. I'll just put my upper baking element on because I really want to get a result here to show you. How much time do I have? Um, you have until 5, 6.57. So you've got like so two or three minutes. How's everyone else's minutes. chart looking? Blonde like mine? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> you might have to drink more wine, people. Um, Steph, how's yours looking? Good. Okay. Um, would you, could you egg wash the pie? Like how would that Yes, be? you could egg wash it as well. But I was wanting to use the garlic oil. Um, for flavour. Egg wash would give you an instant colour but you also want the pastry to be cooked through um, and you need to give it enough time in there for the cheese to melt and the bottom of the pie to cook as well as the top. So there's a balance there. I'm about to get sent home if we're on a cooking show because <laughs> I haven't cooked it because I the tart in time. <laughs> this person's roasting some beetroot and radish for a side salad. With it. I oh, love, that would be a I great love idea. roasted beetroot. That's my favourite. Um, what am I doing with beetroot at the moment? Definitely roasting. I love it actually scrubbed, bigger beetroot, and then sliced into thick pieces, say two centimetres thick or discs, 
and then tossing them in extra virgin olive oil, salt, pepper, and cinnamon um, is a great spice with beetroot, especially if you roast it like that. And then you'd spread them flat over um, a, a baking tray on some paper. Uh, and they cook really quickly as opposed to being whole roasted. To be honest with you, I'm the most impatient cook. I always find the quickest, um, most direct way to get the flavor and the result I want, especially when I've got, you know, 13 or 14, almost 15 year old, constantly hungry. And um, my husband, Michael, doesn't appreciate eating at 10 o'clock at night either. So it's always- <laughs> well, we're, we're gonna be eating at 10 o'clock at night. At no, we're not. No, we're not. Um, when else could we meat like chorizo or crispy bacon bits be in the pie on top as well? Bacon. Bacon or chorizo. Mm, yes, you could. What I would do would be to drape over, over the cooked pie some pieces of jamon or prosciutto or lardo, lardo, thinly sliced uh, fat, <laughs> cured um, and thinly sliced so it just melts. Uh, crispy bacon, yes, or pancetta, crisped up and then finely chopped over and sprinkled over the top would be quite nice. Um, when it's done, if the Zoom call finishes, you'll take a photo and we'll send you I will, I feel, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have one minute. I feel like I've failed you all, but no, you're all going to be enjoying a sumptuous, most delicious cheese pie you've ever liked. So what was that? We've got one minute. One minute. Oh my God. Have a look at the pie, mom. See what it looks like. <laughs> oh, okay. I've good. got some color. you got some color. I'm going to slide it out. It's not cool. slightly golden on the bottom. The pastry is firm, but I do say give yours another five minutes. My oven is now sitting on 220. So if you'd like to increase your temperature, you can. I think what's happened here, I actually doubled the recipe because last time I made this, I made two smaller pies. This is larger. It's taking a little longer, but you can see it's slightly golden here. That's what your pie should look like all over. I'm going to drop on some of those. You need to wrap up now. It's done. It's done. Okay. okay. We're done. And literally just cut into the pie like this. Oh, yeah. You can see inside the cheese is totally melted. It smells amazing. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. That looks amazing, Karen. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Oh, and don't forget the radishes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.